Hey everyone, this Q&A is brought to you by Instagram. These questions were submitted on my Instagram. If you're not following me, go check it out for future Q&A videos. This is usually a style I like to do, ask questions on Instagram, answer them here on YouTube. So I'm gonna be talking over this training footage as you're watching, and I'm two weeks out from a meet, so all the lifts you're seeing are pretty much, are fairly heavy, and that's why, because I'm two weeks out. So let's get started. First question comes from Powerful Omar. How to increase my overhead press? I plateaued at 135 for three months. You've got to increase your volume. I got no idea what your programming looks like right now, but you've got to increase your volume. That's what helped me the most, meaning increasing mainly frequency. So I'm pressing every training session because I've got a meet coming up that tests my press. So I'm pressing every training session four days a week. Uh, I'm also doing bench press along with that. Sometimes I press twice. Uh, on two different uh, workouts within the same day. Uh, so you've got to press more often. Next question comes from Bill B. Harto. How would you train if you can only go to the gym on the weekends? So what I would do is Saturday, I would do a competition squat. So I'd put a belt on. and I'd do my squat workout. <clears throat> then I would do uh, a competition bench. So I'd wear my wrist straps, I'd wear my belt because I, that's what I wear for my comp bench. Then I would do some sort of beltless deadlift variation. And then I'd finish off with some uh, pressing variation, probably pin presses, maybe a shoulder height, chin height, or forehead height. On Sunday, I would deadlift, competition deadlift with a belt. Uh, and then I would do a competition style press. So I wear a belt when I press, I wear wrist straps when I press. Then I would do a beltless squat variation and I would finish up by doing uh, so a bench press variation. Uh, like close grip bench or pin press, maybe incline press. That way, I'm still doing squat, bench, deadlift, and press twice a week, even though it's only on two days out of the week. Griffith Bryan asks the real question, you're making chocolate milk. Do you use Nesquik or Hershey syrup? Hershey syrup. Holy picks. Opinions on lever belts. Reasons why you wear prong belts instead. I don't really see the advantage to a lever belt other than they're easier to get on, but it's really not that hard to get a single prong belt on if you know how to use it against the rack and use your body weight. But I've never used a lever belt, so I don't really have much of an opinion on it. What I will say is I'll never get a lever belt because I wear my belt on the fifth notch for squats, bench, and press and I wear it on the fourth notch when I deadlift. And I would not be able to adjust that without a screwdriver for a lever belt. So that's the main reason why I don't plan on ever wearing a lever belt. Next question is Sam Anderson 3 favorite cheat meal? Eh, I don't really know. I love a good burger, fries, and milkshake, so I'll go with that. All right, I got a lot of questions on whether or not I'm gonna do an Olympic weightlifting meet in the future or strongman again. Uh, probably not do, I probably won't do Olympic weightlifting again. Uh, maybe when I'm old and I want a hobby. Uh, I really enjoy I enjoy it, it was fun. I like watching it, but I don't plan on doing it. Strongman, I don't know. Uh, I've got some goals right now that I really want to achieve, and I'm working with Austin Brocky. and really if I say, hey, I, oh look, I really want to squat 600 pounds. So if I tell Austin, I really want to squat 600 pounds, help me, but I want to do some strongman and compete every once in a while, that's not letting him do his job. So, strongman is not gonna help me squat 600 pounds, so therefore, I'm not doing strongman anytime soon. Next question, Miss, Miss Harry 313, or probably Miss Sherry 313, how can I improve my bench other than more volume? All right, let's think about this question for a second here. So when you're programming, there are two things, two main things you need to consider, volume, and intensity, volume being the number of reps, intensity being percentage of your one or max or weight. Those aren't the only two things you can manipulate. You can manipulate exercise selection or rest periods and things like that. But for sake of brevity, let's just talk about volume and intensity. Those two things have to change, right? If you can't, for some hypothetical reason, you can't change your volume, you can't increase your volume, that would mean that you would have to just increase intensity. The thing about that is there is an absolute, there's a ceiling to intensity, you're one rep max. So you can't always just go up and up and up in intensity. You're gonna hit a roof, you're gonna hit that ceiling. So it gets to the point where your training is now 
maximal training every day, which is not productive, you're just testing your strength every day rather than building it, you're grinding out ugly reps, let's consider this. Doing the same thing every single day, for example, three by five, every single day, not changing anything but intensity, just adding weight to the bar, what does that sound like? That's the starting strength program. Starting strength works for novices, and it works for a short period of time, but it doesn't work forever, it doesn't work for intermediates, it doesn't work for advanced lifters. Eventually, you have to change the volume. So, anyways, that's my take on intensity. There's a ceiling to it, it's your one rep max. You can't continuously improve that or increase that. Now, let's look at something else. How about we, so if we're not gonna change volume, we're not gonna change intensity, how will we change frequency, okay? You're benching twice a week, let's add a third day of bench press. That would help, but you just increased your total weekly volume by adding an entire uh, bench day. So we can't increase frequency without change of volume, all right? Uh, maybe tonnage, you can manipulate tonnage, which is weight times reps. So for example, you did 100 pounds for 10 total reps. That's 1,000 pounds of tonnage, all right? There's two ways you can change that, manipulating volume or intensity. So I could say, all right, let's do 200 pounds for 10 reps, that's 2,000 pounds of tonnage, but you just increased to 200 pounds, that means you increased your intensity. So you just heard my take on intensity. Now, if you went 100 pounds for 20 reps, that's 2,000 pounds of tonnage, but you just manipulated volume, which you said for some hypothetical reason that you can't do. We could also change exercise selection. So let's say uh, you're doing bench three times a week, normal bench press for three sets of five, okay? We're gonna take one of those bench press days out and we're gonna add in a variation. Uh, maybe close grip bench, okay, for three sets of five because you're not changing the volume. Now you're really, in my opinion, just playing around with intensity, right, less or more. So I'm gonna do swap out bench press for close grip bench press. Now I'm just benching less weight because I can bench more normal than I can close grip. Uh, or if you say, all right, I'm gonna do a slingshot day or a partial pin press day, you're lifting more weight, that's just manipulating intensity. You're still not changing volume. So this is my long drawn out way of saying that volume needs to be adjusted. Austin and Jordan often say that volume is infinitely scalable. Volume is the driver for long term progress. So you've got to change it. Next question comes from Laughlin Gregory. What is your opinion on bulking and cutting for average people looking for consistent, hopefully optimal long term progress? So the short answer is if you are underweight, if you're very underweight, you need to gain weight. If you are very overweight, you need to lose weight, unless you're perfectly fine with being really overweight. But in general, you're probably gonna need to lose weight, just for health reasons, if you're very overweight. If you're a normal size person, bulking and cutting is not important, just getting stronger. You can get a lot stronger at your current body weight. Next question is from Mert Sekralagu. How would you program switching to intermediate, I think how would your program switch to intermediate programming for presses while still being on a novice routine? That's possible and it happens often. Uh, I get uh, individuals or clients who can continue making a good amount of progress uh, on linear progression for their squats and deadlifts, but their press and their bench is stalled. So we would adjust their press and their bench and let their uh, uh, deadlift and their squat continue on their linear progression. So usually what it looks like, it, I'll use starting strength for an example, I would, for their press and their bench, I would increase volume once they move to intermediate and I would add another slot. So if they're benching on Monday, pressing on Wednesday, benching on Friday, that's three slots of pressing, I would just add in another, probably on the second day, I would add another pressing slot. The Great Al, are there any worthwhile benefits of deadlifting for volume? Absolutely, I'm not, I don't really understand your question. Why wouldn't you deadlift for volume? Like I said earlier, if you're not manipulating volume at all, you're just gonna be increasing intensity forever. Party Pat says, do you know or have you ever lifted with any of the guys from Cal Strength, athletes or coaches? Uh, what do you think of their program? I did a free seminar, Cal Strength seminar, uh, weightlifting seminar before I did my weightlifting meet uh, and they were all really cool guys. Uh, Dave Spitz is a uh, nice guy, um, but no, I don't really know them or lift with them. I used to love watching Donnie Shankle and John North back in the old uh, 
Cal Strength days. Uh, I still watch and follow on Instagram and, and sometimes on YouTube the guys right now. I love watching Wes Kitts. He's got really impressive numbers. They've got good strong squats. So yeah, mix scale B. Advice for anyone who wants to be a starting strength coach and what would you do differently? I would suggest training lots and lots of people using the method that they teach in starting strength before you go to get your credential because you have to be evaluated on your ability to coach someone in real life, in real time. And that's hard for a lot of people to do if you're not experienced, no matter how much you know about the book, if you're not experienced and seeing it right in front of you and correcting it on the fly, it's gonna be difficult. So coach a lot of people using the method. Uh, and read the book over and over and over, two, three times. I would also suggest reading the articles on the website. They're very helpful and they, uh, some of the, the authors expand on uh, topics in starting strength more in articles than the book does. Uh, I would read Analyzing the Squat on Starting Strength, just Google that, uh, and also uh, Balance Training. Those were very helpful in uh, the exam part of your getting your starting strength credential. Double N, double F. Hey Alan, how important was it for starting out to have a community of lifting friends prior to opening your gym? I didn't have a community of lifting friends when I opened up Untamed Strength. Um, I had my brothers who showed up, my uh, girlfriend showed up, she brought friends, my brothers brought some friends. So for a very long time, it was just this network of people who were close to me bringing in other people. And it wasn't uh, until quite some time that people actually started coming to Untamed Strength who had no relation to anyone that was already at the gym. So I don't think it's that important, it's helpful, but I didn't have a core group of friends that I was, or training part that I was training with. One Jaro, got a belt, love it for squats, bench, overhead press. Tried deadlifting with it and I just can't get used to it. I'm progressing fine without it, but now that I'm deadlifting over 600 with a goal of hitting 700, is it something I'm gonna have to get used to or eventually can I just continue without it? You can do whatever you'd like, but if you wanna be competitive, you're, you should use your belt. Um, you just need to try out different belts. Four inch, three inch, a 10 millimeter, 13 millimeter. I wear mine one notch looser than my bench and my, uh, I'm sorry, than my squat and my press. So you might just play around with that. Wear it a little bit higher, maybe. You just gotta figure it out. Charles Brisk, shorter, more frequent sessions seem to work better for my recovery and schedule. How might you set up a template for five times per week for someone who just finished starting strength LP? I'm not gonna give you a template. I would suggest checking out, well, I would, would suggest checking out the bridge on the Barbell Medicine website, but it's not five times a week. I think that you have to get over this, uh, this idea that you have to be recovered from session to session because you don't. I do not feel recovered from session to session, I promise. I'm actually just starting to feel recovered from the last three or four weeks of hard training. So you don't have to feel a 100% recovered from session to session. And it's not necessarily that your ability to recover gets worse and worse as you're an intermediate or advanced lifter. It's the fact that your training stress goes up. It's much higher than when you were a novice. As an intermediate, late intermediate, or advanced lifter, the amount of stress that you have to accumulate in order to disrupt homeostasis and actually get stronger is a lot more than just one training session. You don't do a squat workout on Monday and then come in Wednesday and PR from that one squat workout like you did when you were a novice. All of your training stress has to be accumulated over weeks or months. This is why lifters use block periodization. They have a developmental block and then an accumulation block and a transmutation block and a realization block where they can finally realize the improvements they've made during the past few blocks where they accumulated a whole lot of stress. Akshashiyana Sana Hanahu, number one. I herniated my disc, L4, L5, four months ago. What exercises should I do to strengthen my back so I can get back to squatting and deadlifting? Man, this is the easiest question of the day. You need to squat and deadlift. Can you, can you deadlift a 45 pound barbell from the rack at mid shin? Can you squat a 45 pound, 45 pound barbell without pain? If not, I would suggest using a lighter bar, a training bar. I have a 15 pound bar 
at untamed strength. Uh, you need a squat and you need a deadlift. You just need to start light and slowly work your way up from there. Baker Rooney asks, how to differentiate between needing more volume or actually less volume when progress stops? Well, I'd have to look at what you're currently doing, but I'll get to give you an answer. In general, I'm sure that the majority of you watching this or the majority of you listening to this uh, <clears throat> are probably following starting strength, linear progression, strong lifts, five by five, or something like five, three, one. People who are following those programs and not making progress need more volume. If you think about starting strength, linear progression, or strong lifts five by five, once you get to the end of that progression, the weight starts to be too damn heavy. You are failing because the weight is too heavy. You have reached the ceiling of intensity. You're not, you're not failing to make progress because the volume's too much. It's because the intensity is too high, in which case you need to adjust the volume. The volume needs to go up and intensity needs to be scaled accordingly. So I would say that in general, the majority of you listening to this probably need more volume, not less. And if you're following five through one, same thing, I already did a video about this. The volume on five through one is just not enough for an intermediate lifter. The Arian McBride, do you have a preferred br brand or type of barbell? The majority of, most of the barbells in Untamed Strength are Ohio Power Bars. I also like a BNR bar. It's a good power bar, but it's got a little bit less aggressive knurling. So if you were gonna do power cleans, it still works. You cannot do power cleans with an Ohio power bar. The center knurling will trash your neck. Ivan David Deck. So there's pretty clear proof that the consumption of dietary cholesterol leads to increases in blood cholesterol and heart disease. With this in mind, why do you recommend to athletes who are trying to bulk to consume large quantities of cholesterol containing foods like eggs, milk, etc.? Because they are high in calories. King of Nightmares, what's the best Metallica album? I like their early stuff. I'd probably say Ride the Lightning, but I really like Kill Em All, and I really like Master of Puppets. Okay, next few questions I'll answer are about the Marine Corps and career stuff. So if you didn't go in the Marines and doing what you're doing now, where do you reckon you'd end up? That was from OHG Batford. I have no idea. The only answer I could give you is I actually joined, signed up for culinary school before I joined the Marine Corps. And on orientation day, I said, nope, joining the Marine Corps. So I'm not sure what I'd be doing now. Jagsy Wagsy, what do you think you would be doing if you had never started Untamed Strength? So this is a little bit different question. Uh, while I was in the Marine Corps, I earned my, or I got earned, I got my uh, Cat One Yankee White security clearance. And if I didn't do, if I didn't want to open a gym and come back to California, I probably would have done something with Secret Service. Brandon Vangrol, do you ever miss the Marine Corps and do you have any advice for a big guy trying to get in the Marines? I don't miss being in the Marine Corps, but I do miss uh, some of the guys that I met. And advice for a big guy trying to get in the Marines, you need to lose weight. One, so you can fit the height and weight standards. Uh, and two, losing weight is gonna help you run faster and it's gonna help you do more pull-ups. MGJ460, what's your favorite memory from the Marines? I don't have one particular favorite memory. <clears throat> I do have quite a bit. Uh, if I was to start from the beginning of my career, my contract, <clears throat> I would say that, uh, well, I, I earned, uh, I was company honorman at a boot camp. Uh, so there's six platoons of 60 to 70 recruits. So that's 360 to 420 recruits. I don't know what the exact number was. And I was the top recruit. So I was promoted and I was recognized at boot camp graduation, which was pretty cool for me. Uh, it was cool for my family to see. They got some like special seats to sit in. My oldest brother was a Marine, so he was pretty pretty proud of me, so that was cool. Um, <clears throat> I was presidential security, so the first time I met President Obama was uh, pretty surreal. Um, I got to take my dad to the, uh, the Oval Office, take our picture and meet President Obama, so that was really cool. Um, after uh, so what I did was I joined the Marine Corps infantry 0311. I was picked for presidential security, which is security forces. Uh, I was in DC in Camp David. After that, I went back to DC to be a Marine Corps body bearer, which are pallbearers at Arlington National Cemetery. We would perform funerals for fallen Marines. So I was never deployed. I was stateside the whole time. 
so I don't have, uh, so I guess uh, one memory that stands out as uh, one of the most powerful memories was at, when I was a body bearer, my first KIA funeral, killed in action funeral, full honors funeral. Um, <clears throat> it was a 19 year old kid, Marine, who died in Afghanistan uh, and doing, doing his funeral and seeing, uh, seeing the look on his uh, wife's face, his pregnant wife and uh, their whole family and seeing how distraught uh, she was and his family and then having to present them with a folded flag was pretty powerful uh, and it's something I'll never forget. Andrew Provolone, have you ever done something wrong when it came to training someone? If so, how did you correct it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before I was working with Austin, I did not know as much as I know now about programming. And so I would say that the programs I was writing were more like workout routines, uh, more so than a program. But I didn't, once I started learning, it was just kind of like a, ah, that makes sense. So I've been doing this wrong, or I could better optimize this. And there wasn't anything that was drastically changed. I would just tell someone, hey, we're gonna start doing more of this. We're gonna change this up a little bit. I think that this will work better than what you're doing right now. Jack the offbeat, is there a general rule of thumb for how much to weight, how much to weigh in at to be competitive for your height? Uh, six, he's six one, should I shoot for 210 or something? If you're six foot one, you should be a 220, probably a 242. Or for USAPL, as a competitor power you should be a 105 minimum. That's what I would suggest. Particular Perkins, how did you get started working with Barbell Medicine? I started working with Austin Baraki. That's how I found out about Barbell Medicine. Um, <clears throat> and I started working with Austin. That's been asked too, how did you, how did you go about starting to work with Austin or why? Um, I was stuck in my training. I was not making any progress. I didn't know how to increase my lifts from where I was at. And I kind of came to the realization that, damn, I don't know as much as I think I know. So I need to learn a lot. And I was watching the, YouTube, or the Starting Strength YouTube. I saw him, his name pop up a few times. I've read some of his articles on the Starting Strength website. And one of the members of Untamed Strength knew him or knew of him. And I talked to him and he said, dude, if you're thinking about getting coaching from him, do it. Don't hesitate. Uh, contact him right now. And so I did. And then I started working with him that way. Austin's associated with, he works for Barbell Medicine with Jordan. And so that's how all of that came about. Lifting liberal. Do you view weak points from a movement or muscle perspective, i.e. triceps versus a weak lockout? So I view training from a movement perspective. I train movements, not necessarily muscles. So I would view weak points as a movement. Uh, so if someone had a weak deadlift or a weak spot of the deadlift, I wouldn't say, man, you know what? We need to hammer on your low back, your glutes and your hamstrings. I would just have them deadlift more often. I would have them use variations and that's how it fix their deadlift with movement, not by isolating muscles. Redwood Powerhouse, how long has the process been going from the garage gym to where you're at now? I was training in my garage the summer of 2013. It is now October 2017 and I've got Untamed strength, so four years. The Donut Destroyer. What kind of conditioner do you use? Whatever Caitlin buys. Right now it's Herbal Essence. Cero257, what's the number one mistake you made when you started your own gym or business? I'm gonna say it is not knowing my target audience. I tried to attract everyone, old ladies, high school football players, powerlifters, weightlifters, just everyone, I wanted to bring everyone in. Uh, and I didn't have any direction, but once I realized that I've got a pretty good place for strongman, I've got good strongman equipment, I ran with that. I hosted a strongman competition, and that definitely helped with getting the word out that there was a strongman gym in the area. And that's kind of what set me apart, because there's commercial gyms everywhere, there's CrossFit gyms everywhere, so I was really the only strongman gym. So you gotta know your target audience. Got a lot of questions about high bar. Do I do high bar? Do I, would I ever program high bar for an intermediate or an advanced lifter? Yes, I don't have a problem with high bar. When I teach someone how to squat for the first time, I teach them at a low bar, unless they have something, some sort of limitation that prevents them from doing it, but it's usually not the case. But yes, I program 
high bar squats to get more squatting in uh, with less weight on the bar because usually if you're proficient with a low bar, you can low bar more than you can high bar. So it's a way to get a good training, training effect, training stress without having to put a bunch of weight on the bar. It's a good way to train your legs a little bit more um, and it might be a little break on your back. If you're really trying to drive your deadlift up, so yes, the high bar is programmed. Matthew McNulty, will you be doing a bench press 2.0 and power clean tutorial videos? Yes, those videos take a long time. I've been extremely busy lately, but I do want to make those new how-to videos. What will probably have to happen is I'll probably have to take a couple weeks off of YouTube just to work on those videos. But yeah, I plan on doing it in the future. Long fellow Steed, if you aren't able to make a training day or two short vacations and business trips, is it best to pick up where you left off and essentially push your program back by the number of days you missed or completely skip them all together and continue the program as if you didn't miss those days? I would go back to where you left off. Brennan McKeenan, what was the first program you ever did? I started lifting uh, in middle school and throughout high school for high school football. My coach didn't really know much in terms of programming for like powerlifting, but his exercise selection was good. Um, we did, we squatted, we benched, we did some uh, overhead like push presses, we did cleans, and we did a lot of sprints, we front squatted, and we did that four times a week, and we just rotated between those lifts all the time. Um, so that's where I started lifting, but the actual program that you guys would be familiar with, first program I started was when I was in the Marine Corps, and it was 5-3-1. Angus McCollum, are there decent benefits to loading a barbell with about 10% more than you can overhead press and perform sets of push presses but using a five to 10 second negative? I'm gonna say no. I talked about this in my recent Untamed special video, Pin Press. Go check that out. Your answer will be found in that video. JMK95, how, why did you decide to finally get your starting strength certification? So while working with Austin, a lot of what he was telling me or a lot of what the corrections he was making is stuff that's taught in starting strength. So I pretty much wanted to learn more. I admired how much Austin knew and I knew that getting my starting strength certification would be one step in the right direction of learning more. So that's why I did it. Uh, starting strength is only a tiny fraction of Austin's knowledge base, but it's a good start and I would highly recommend anyone to at least ten, attend a seminar uh, a starting strength seminar. Steven Knox, when did you decide to pursue your own place? What was the first step in that process? Now that you had some time, some success, how have you continued to grow? Has YouTube helped the success of your gym or has your gym had its own success separate from your channel? So the first, I decided while I was in the Marine Corps. So I still had about a year and a half, maybe two years left in the Marine Corps before I opened up Untamed Strength. That was a lot of time for me to sit and think about what I wanted to do. Uh, it was also a good opportunity for me to save money. I had always, uh, before I got out of the Marine Corps, I was very stingy with my money and I had a lot saved up. So that helped with the whole process. But once I got out of the Marine Corps and I started to pursue this uh, dream of opening up Untamed Strength, I was very irresponsible. Definitely not what they teach you in business class. Um, I bought a little bit of equipment for my garage and that's where I started but I wasn't training anyone out of that garage. Uh, I knew I need to get a location. So my roommate at the time was a commercial real estate agent. He helped me find a warehouse, which really you could look for on Craigslist, honestly. But I found a warehouse for lease. Uh, I signed a two year lease with that warehouse. It was very small. It was within my budget that I was looking to pay monthly. And I paid my first and last month's rent and a security deposit. And that was it. I said, shit. I got no clients and no equipment, so let's get to it. I need to fill this thing with equipment, then I'll start getting clients. So it was, uh, like I said, irresponsible. But I was just sick and tired of waiting around, asking questions, wondering, what should I do this, should I do that? I just wanted to act and figure stuff out along the way. And has YouTube helped my success? Yes, absolutely. I don't know where I would be without YouTube. I'm not saying that I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have any success if I hadn't uh, started YouTube, but YouTube was very, very helpful in getting members to the gym. Um, it also opened up a lot of other opportunities like I can sell clothing or I can do uh, online training and uh, stuff like that. I can make ad revenue from YouTube videos. and So it's opened up other avenues. <clears throat> but there are plenty of people who come to Untamed Strength. Once YouTube started getting popular, Untamed Strength started getting popular. So it would index on Google much better. 
So people, a lot of people come into the gym, sign up for a membership because they want, they've just heard about the gym. They don't know that I make YouTube videos. They don't know Alan Thrall. They don't watch my videos, right? They just heard the gym or they were looking for a powerlifting gym and, or a strongman gym in Sacramento and they found it. So I don't know. Uh, but YouTube has definitely helped with my success. But I've also hosted competitions at Untamed Strength and that was a big success. So a little bit of both, I guess. Jay Fox, when will we make more cooking videos? I've actually got one planned this week. I may or may not do it, but stay tuned. Ethan Meta says, why are barbells superior to dumbbells? Obviously you can't squat with dumbbells, but when it comes to movements like the bench press, isn't there a longer range of motion and therefore more muscle engagement? So I train with barbells because I want to get stronger. And if I want to get stronger, I'm going to pick movements that allow me to use the most amount of weight and they're trained through an effective range of motion. The bench press with a barbell is an effective range of motion. The difference in range of motion between a barbe uh, dumbbells and a barbell is negligible. Let's just say, for example, that you the range of motion for dumbbells is 5% more than a barbell. Well, the amount of weight I can lift with a barbell is way more than 5% of what I can lift with a dumbbell. I might be able to pre bench press 100 pound dumbbells Okay, but I can, that's 200 pounds, but I can bench press 300 pounds. You see the difference in percentages there? So just because it has an inch or two greater range of motion does not mean that it is better for gaining strength. That's it guys, this was a long video. I hope you learned something. Stay tuned for future videos, future Q and A's, yada, yada, yada. Until next time, always remember, Tread on time!